if you'll turn your books to uh, the page with this print on it, sample one, um, we'll take a look at the drawing and then we'll create the geometry that we need for this part. This is a very simple part, just has four holes in it. Uh, the holes are defined as being 3H through uh, in four places. Uh, when we get to creating toolpath, these will be reamed holes. Uh, that's not really important here. Uh, we're going to simply create four points to define the hole locations. Now, Gibbs Cam, when you're drilling uh, or you know, creating hole operations, Gibbs really doesn't care whether the geometry is circles or points. For the purposes of the class, what we're going to do or what I'm going to do is for holes that are smaller than an inch in diameter, I'm going to create points. And if they are an inch or larger in diameter, I'm going to create circles. Uh, there's no magic to that. Uh, in reality, I probably draw circles more often for holes than I do points uh, for the simple reason that if I have multiple hole sizes, I can select those holes by the circle diameter. Uh, but for the purposes of the class, just to fit in kind of with the flow of what we're doing and what we're learning, uh, I'll draw points for the smaller holes, at least through the first several exercises. Uh, and then uh, we'll draw uh, points for the smaller holes and circles for the larger holes. All right, so the other, I guess, preliminary thing that I want to say is that Part of, a large part of, of what I'm going to try to teach during the course of this class is kind of the way that I look at drawings and I look at the, the tasks that I need to do and analyze them and, and figure out how I'm going to approach them. Okay, looking at the drawing, uh, I can see that these two holes share the same X value. These two holes share the same Y value. The fourth hole is defined as a distance and an angle measured from the third hole. Uh, so this, this hole would be defined as a polar location. The first three holes are defined explicitly by their X and Y value. So in Gibbs Cam, they're considered explicit locations. The fourth hole is a polar location. All right, looking at our material, uh, first off, it's aluminum, 6061 T6 aluminum, uh, one inch thick, and the part is four inches wide, six inches long. For the purposes of the class, we're going to assume that our material is already cut to size. So we're just going to create a stock piece that is one inch thick, four inches wide, six inches long. All of our dimensions are coming from the left rear corner, so that's going to be our origin location. We're going to touch our tools off on top of the part. So with that in mind, in Gibbs Cam, we're going to go to our document control dialog and we're going to create a new part called sample one. We're already set to aluminum and uh, we're working in inches. All right, so for the size of our part, if our part is six inches long and the origin's the left side, then the right side of our part, or our maximum X, is going to be six inches. Uh, if the left side of our part is the origin, then the left side of, side of our part is going to be at X zero. And I'm just tabbing between these fills. I'm hitting the tab button to move between fills, which generally is going to be the best way to, to navigate these dialogues that have several fills that you need to address as you go through. The Y maximum, or the maximum Y value, if the back edge of our part is the origin, then the back edge of our part, or the maximum Y, is going to be zero. If our part is four inches wide, the back edge is the origin, then the front edge is going to be at Y minus four. If our part is one inch thick, we're touching our, parts, uh, touching our tools off on top of the part, then the top of the part, or the maximum Z value, will be zero, and the minimum Z value will be minus one. Assuming we're holding our part in a vise, a clearance plane of 100 thousandths is adequate. I don't need a tool change position for this. We're going to assume a milling class of cap 40. Uh, what this does is it controls the library of tool holders that I'm presented if I choose to put my tools in tool holders, uh, which uh, when we get to creating tool path, uh, we may look at some tool holders, but for the most part on a three-axis mill, I usually don't bother displaying my tool holder unless I'm concerned about clearance for some reason. 
All right, now before I exit this page, I'm going to hit Save, and I'm going to X out. All right, another kind of personal, th not personal thing, but another uh, consideration that, that I take into account that you may or may not be worried about is Gibbs has a coordinate system plane indicator, uh, which can be a shaded plane, it can be a grid, or it can be both. Uh, that's controlled on the smaller toolbar, the, the left-hand smaller toolbar, and it's the last button on the toolbar that the label says CS Plane. Now I can either click through the choices here of having a shaded plane with a grid, shaded plane without a grid, grid without a shaded plane, or nothing, or I can click the drop-down arrow next to it and select the choice that I want. When I'm working with geometry typically, especially on a three-axis machine, I'm really not typically concerned with coordinate systems. Uh, there are certainly exceptions to that, but in most cases I'm not. Uh, so I'll leave the coordinate system plane off. All right, now we're going to look at our geometry creation palette. All right, this is our geometry creation palette. Uh, we have the ability to create points lines, circles, shapes that includes text for engraving, offsetting a shape, creating boxes, polygons, ellipses, gear tooth prof profiles, cam load profiles, and combining shapes, sort of Boolean functions for shapes. B-spline curves, uh, chamfers and fillet radiuses on non-tangent corners, pulling geometry from a solid, the connect button, which we'll talk about uh, at length a little later, and Geometry Expert, which is a different tool for creating geometry uh, that we will also be discussing at length uh, on sample three. All right, generally speaking, especially with the first three points, lines, and circles, the general flow uh, could be described as three steps. You select the shape that you want to create. Uh, let's just say lines. You're presented with a menu of ways that lines can be defined. You select the one that applies to the information that you have, the, the stuff that you know to describe the line or to define the line. And then you're presented with a dialog where you give it that information, the information that you said that you had about the line. Uh, in any of the sub palettes or the sub menus here, uh, we'll have this button called the return button with the dot and slash on it that takes us back to the top level palette without creating any geometry. Alternately, if you're in one of these sub menus, you can just hit the escape button and it does the same thing, it takes you back out to the top level geometry palette without creating any geometry. Now in this case, we're going to create points. The First three points that we want to create, we know the X, Y, Z location. So we're going to click the X, Y, Z button or the explicit point button. And we're presented with a dialog where we can enter the X, Y, and Z value of the point that we want to create. Now in Gibbscam, toolpath does not depend, generally speaking, on the Z depth that the geometry is at. So in my classes, I teach you to draw everything at Z0. Uh, in the rare occasions that it, you do need geometry somewhere other than at Z0, uh, I encourage you, especially as a new user, to create the geometry at Z0 and then move it to the Z level that you need it at. And the reason for that is Gibbs remembers what values are in each of these dialogs uh, until you change it. So if I were to enter a value in, in Z, it's going to stay in this dialog until I change it back to Z0, which means that it would be easy for me to start getting geometry at incorrect Z levels. Uh, I could end up with a shape that, you know, looking straight down on it, it looks correct, but from an isometric view, it could look like a roller coaster. And by default, the tool's gonna follow the roller coaster. Um, so, and, and plus there's just no reason in the vast majority of cases to have your geometry anywhere other than at Z zero. Uh, so we're gonna leave the Z's at zero for everything. All right. The X value of my first hole location, if we jump back to the drawing, is one inch. So X1, Y minus one to the first hole. X1, Y minus three to the second hole. 
x3, y minus 3 to the third hole. And then the fourth hole is a polar hole location two inches away from this hole at a 35 degree elevation. So my first hole is at x1, so I'm just going to type 1. I don't have to type the decimal point or uh, point 0. Gibbs assumes that a whole number is a whole number. Uh, so 1, and I'm tabbing over to y, and I'm entering minus 1. So this is my first hole location. If we look over here to the right, we will see two action buttons. We have a button with a single point on it and a button with two points on it. If I were drawing a line, I would have a button with a single line, a button with two lines. If I was drawing a circle, I would have a button with one circle, a button with two circles. The button with a single point line or circle on it is the single feature button. And notice that it's got a blue border around it, if you look closely. That means that it's the default. That means that hitting enter is the same as clicking that button. So hitting enter creates the point that I just defined and exits me back out to the top level palette. Right Now I'm hitting control Z, which is undo. You also have an undo button right up here at the top. So I'm going to undo. I'm going to go back into point, back into explicit point, and notice that my values are still here. X1, Y minus 1. If instead of hitting enter or clicking on this button, I click on this button, it creates that point but leaves me in this dialog. This is called the multi-feature button. So the multi-feature button creates the, the defined piece of geometry but leaves you in this dialog to continue defining other pieces using the same dialog. All right, I'm going to undo again and return out of here. All right, I'm going to go back into point, explicit point. Notice that the single feature button is always active when you first come into one of the geometry creation dialogs. Now, since my hands are on the mouse when I enter these numbers, I'm typing one, tab, minus one. The shortcut or the keyboard command for multi-feature is just shift enter. Enter is the same as hitting single feature, shift enter, is the multi-feature and it switches the default now the blue border is around the multi-feature button so I can just hit enter from this point forward I don't have to hit shift enter every time All right let me exit back out of here one more time and now let's go through our first three points so I'm gonna go to point explicit point one tab minus one shift enter there's our first point the second point, the X value does not change. So I'm just going to tab to Y, enter minus 3, enter. All right. For the third point, the Y stays the same. The X changes. So I simply type 3, enter. All right. That's the last point that I can create using this dialog. So since my hands are on the keyboard, I'm going to hit the escape button. If my hands were on the mouse, I would click on the return button. So I'm going to hit escape. All right. Now I'm going to undo all the way back. I'm going to go through and then finish out with the fourth point. So point, explicit point, one, tab, minus one, and then shift, enter. That's the multi-feature. Tab, minus three, enter. Three, enter. Escape. And then I'm going to go to point, polar point. All right, in polar point, it's asking for a reference location. If I have one of these yellow dots at my reference location, I can simply click on it. Notice this says none right now. When I click on that, it will enter the label P3, point number three, as my reference location, and it automatically advances to distance, D for distance. I can enter the distance and then tab to the angle. All right. Now, if I don't have one of the yellow dots at my reference location, notice that the label for my reference point is a button. I can simply click that button and type in my reference location. But if I have a yellow dot there, just select the dot, give it a distance of two, tab to angle, 35 angles are measured from three o'clock. So for my reference straight out to the right is zero degrees, straight up is 90. So this is just gonna be 35 degrees. And all I have to do is hit enter because I'm just creating a single point. All right. So let me get rid of all of those, and I'm going to go through this one more time, kind of at speed. So I'm going to go to point, 
explicit point, one tab minus one, shift enter, tab minus three, enter, three, enter, escape, point, polar point, I'm going to reference this location, a distance of two, at 35 degrees, enter. And that's the geometry needed for sample one. All right, go ahead and create a, uh, a file in your classwork folder. Uh, call it sample one and uh, set up your document control dialog for a six inch long, four inch wide, one inch thick piece of stock with your origin on the top left rear corner. Make sure you have a safe clearance plane. I use point one typically, but whatever you typically use in a vice setup uh, is fine here. Uh, make sure you save the part at the beginning and X out. Open your geometry palette and create your four hole locations.